Just before we start the show, I want to take an opportunity to invite you to join me for the Podfluence Weekly Newsletter, which is available both on LinkedIn and through the official newsletter channel. Now, if you are on LinkedIn and it's easier for you to follow there, then please just click on the link in the show notes, which will take you straight to Podfluence on LinkedIn, where you can subscribe for free and get weekly updates on Podfluence articles as well as episodes. If you would like to subscribe to the full newsletter where you'll get additional materials and, as my little incentive to you, my pre-podcast guest checklist for you to use when you're appearing on podcast shows so that you can be fully prepared every single time, then please click the link to the official newsletter in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the show. I'm Johnny Ball. On the Speaking Influence show, we delve into the knowledge, skills, experience, stories and secrets of some of the world's best influence and persuasion experts. We have in-depth conversations with people who are out in the world applying and often teaching the tools of ethical influence and persuasion and maybe sometimes the not-so-ethical side of things too. Guests range from successful authors and entrepreneurs, secret service members and psychologists, marketing and branding experts, even the occasional professional comedian or world champion in speaking or storytelling, former cult members, neuroscientists, voice coaches, professional stylists, political speech writers, and public speaking experts. Every episode takes our guest knowledge and experience and turns it into actionable information that you can use to build a stronger understanding of how the world of influence and persuasion works and become a better wielder of the weapons of ethical influence and persuasion in life and in business leaving each of us a little smarter than better off than we were before. This week, I am being joined by a very special guest. I have probably mentioned before on the show to people who have tuned in regularly that I have been very keen to get Chris Voss on the show. He's the author of Never Split the Difference, former FBI hostage negotiator, Before you get too excited, it's not Chris who's coming on the show. However, I will keep working on that. I will do my best to get him on at some point. I wanted someone who had specific knowledge about business negotiations, and I really do not think I could have found a better guest than my guest today, Mike Lander. Now, Mike is an expert business negotiator and he teaches and trains specifically business negotiation skills. He is someone who maybe doesn't agree with everything that Chris Voss teaches. So sometimes it's okay to have differences of opinion. His experience is much more in the business world than anything else. And he's here to share some very valuable insights and knowledge with us. After this conversation, I felt so much wiser about negotiations than before. And this is an episode that I know I will be referring to time and time again to get more and more of this great content. Mike is a guest who I will invite back in the future because he has such great expertise and there is so much more that we didn't get time to cover today. However, I'm very pleased with this show. I think it's a fantastic show. It turned out to be an amazing conversation about the true art of business negotiations. So I'll leave you now to listen to my conversation with business negotiation expert Mike Lander. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Speaking Influence, the show that explores the psychology and application of ethical influence and persuasion in life and business with persuasive presentations and podcasting coach Johnny Ball. If you have an online business, you need to work on list building. The easiest way to get started for free is ConvertKit. It's recommended by industry pros like Pat Flynn, Chris Ducker, and our very own Johnny Ball. Click the link in the show notes and start building your list today. Welcome to Speaking Influence. We are going live. And I've been pretty clear on shows recently that this year I'm having a much bigger focus on the influence and persuasion side of things. It's what people really want. It's where my 
passions really lie as well. And what could be more important in terms of influence and persuasion skills than understanding negotiations? Now, I have definitely done a lot of reading and studying into negotiations, and I've been wanting to discuss this on the show for the longest time. So my guest today is an expert on negotiation skills. Not only is he a multiple business owner and sold like multiple figure businesses as well, but he is a go-to person for negotiations. And we're going to really get into it. So let me first of all introduce to the show, Mike Lander. Hi, Johnny. Very good to meet you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be a guest. I'm very happy to be bringing you on the show, Mike. I've been looking forward to this conversation and we're going to get into it. But before we get into the interview, I do have one question for you that's completely unrelated to (laughs) negotiation skills. But just to get a bit of a sense of who you are, if you had your own theme song, what would it be? Oh, my word, my own theme song. So I, I listen to an awful lot of music. It would probably be, well, it would probably be... Insomnia. Great choice. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because me and my wife at our wedding had that as our wedding dance. Oh, fantastic. Well, there you go. <laughs> that's an interesting choice of wedding dance. Well, Absolutely. <laughs> fantastic. We are here live with Mike Lander, negotiation expert, and I've been so excited about this conversation. So let's really dive into it. Mike, tell us a little bit more about what you do in terms of negotiation, what you teach, who you help, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, So my background, I've got a background in supply chain and procurement. So I've been a procurement director for some quite big companies that were private equity backed, some of which are now worth over a billion dollars. And I've procured hundreds of deals, negotiated hundreds of deals, and probably bought over $450 million worth of uh, goods and services. So my background is as a buyer. And so what I do now is I flip that on its head and said, I'm going to help sellers, SMEs, high growth companies to negotiate better deals with big companies when they meet them. Because what happens is a lot of high growth companies often found the lead, builds a sales team, that sales team starts to engage with big organizations. And when they hit these big companies, they meet professional buyers like I used to be. And so I give them the insights into how do I prepare? What makes good negotiation? How do you get a more balanced outcome? So I now work on the sell side rather than the buy side. Yeah. Just how critical are negotiation skills? How much of a difference can it make? Oh, a massive difference. Lots of research done into this over many, many years. And uh, some of the research that was done looked at the increase in net profit compared to negotiation maturity. I think it was done by Huthwaite many years ago. And uh, there was a direct correlation between the improved negotiation skills of buyers, in this case, versus the increase in net profits. Because it's all about preparation, having a process, knowing what your goals are, tracking down the issues and making sure you manage those down. And uh, yeah, it's about also confidence. What they found was one of the biggest, there's two big things you can do to make a negotiated outcome better in terms of more balanced or better for you. Number one is confidence. When you walk into the negotiation, your own mental state, your confidence in that negotiation has a big impact. And secondly, your preparation. Most people that when they go into a negotiation, a sales negotiation, selling a business, whatever it might be, they haven't prepared as well as they could. And that's because they don't have a process and they don't have templates. And again, if you look at organizations like Harvard, a clearly massively credible academic institution, right. they've got a organization called PON, a program on negotiation, which is a kind of a coming together of the legal faculty with the uh, business faculty and the negotiation people there. And if you look at that, they say, most people don't have a process. If you don't have a process, then every negotiation is new. You rely on your instincts, your natural ability. And sometimes we forget things. Have a process, have some templates, write things down, and you'll get better outcomes. Yeah. Is that also maybe partly a tendency of people to think that they can just wing it? Absolutely. So I've worked with some brilliant negotiators in the past who many would look at and say they're instinctive negotiators. They're just brilliant negotiators. And yes, they are. What you'll often find is there's a a bag carrier in the background. And I've been people's bag carrier as their negotiation prep and negotiation coach. And I do all the background work. I do all the research. I do the preparation. I'd work out what the variables were. I'd work out what our best outcome could be and what our least favorable but acceptable outcome could be. I do all that prep. 
And then the front person would go in and they'd negotiate. And many of those people that I've worked with are, they're very, very quick mentally at producing commercial models and working out the trade-offs in their head. But the preparation in advance allows them to do that. And that's, it often looks like they're just instinctively brilliant. There's often many, many hours of prep gone into that in the background. So, so with preparation and processes, mm-hmm. could anybody become a better negotiator? Absolutely anyone. Absolutely anyone. <clears throat> if you look at the psychological profiles, if you do personality testing of different negotiators, then yes, there are some themes. People that are more uh, rationally oriented, more data oriented, more process oriented, uh, yes, they tend to be, on the whole, uh, more negotiators are like that than not. But highly creative people, but massively creative people can learn the basics of improving a negotiated outcome just by doing some very simple things. Mm. So other than not having a plan and not preparing, <laughs> what, what are the things that people go wrong with mostly in negotiation from your experience? So there's a few things that just kind of like spring to mind. Not having a BATNA. So people say, what's a BATNA? Some work was done by a guy called William Yori, again from Harvard, many, many years ago. He wrote a brilliant book, which I'm sure you'll put in the show notes, called Getting to Yes. Yeah. And that was agree. all about, you've read that. I thought uh, it was, to me, it was a, a brilliant piece of foundation work in negotiation. And they talk about BATNAs, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. If you walk into a negotiation and you have no alternative but to do this deal, then you've started off on the wrong foot already. Let me give you two examples. A salesperson walks into a meeting with a client. They're desperate to get the deal. And why are they desperate? Well, it's a big deal with a big corporation and their sales pipeline's weak. Their batner's dreadful. If I'm the buyer and my economic buyer, the person with the budget, wants to use the supplier, I've now got a massive upper hand. I just have. If you looked at in Europe, look at the Brexit negotiations that happened. Was there a negotiation? Well, <laughs> very interesting. Absolutely. And, and this is not a political stance at all, whether you're <laughs> pro or against what happened with Brexit. But the reality was the strength of the baton was very weak. Right. Because the public decided the direction they wanted to go in, which was to leave. And the people that were promoting that hadn't really thought through in advance In detail, I don't believe what would happen next. And I think if you look at the last kind of three years in business uh, and the economy about what's played out, that does ring true. Yeah, it it very much seems the case. It's it's a great example and one that a lot of people will be able to say, yeah, okay, we we can see. Yeah, they can relate to it. Exactly. (laughs) Also, something else that comes up a lot, and this is, there are two things. Ego gets in the way. Because it's a highly emotional, emotionally charged situation, When you walk into the negotiation, people are often quite emotionally charged. And so it only takes a small trigger to take someone slightly over the edge. Mm. And you'll hear shouting and you'll see table thumping and you'll see red faces and anger and annoyance. And all those are emotional reactions. So another tip for your uh, audience is when you go into a negotiation, try and become emotionally detached. So you walk in in a calm state. You've prepared. And that alone, if someone starts, there's a, have you heard of the PAC model, parent, adult, child model in psychology? Uh, Yeah, I'm not overly familiar with it, but I have heard of it. So for your audience, uh, that's about, you have this kind of parent to parent, adult to adult and child to child relationships. And what often happens in a negotiation is, imagine if you've got children, you're the parent and the child, The way that that language plays out often is that the child's done something wrong, you're scolding the child, you're berating them for something they've done, you're annoyed that they won't do what you want. In negotiations, some negotiators will try and take the parent role and push you into the child role. Hmm. If you feel that happening, you feel like the weaker counterpart. You feel like you're on the defensive. A simple tactic to help stop that is to go to data. Adults tend to talk to adults in a rational, data-oriented way. Not all the time, but most of the time. So if you bring data to the table or you ask probing questions about why, it tends to shut the other person down if they're trying to act as that kind of parent-child. And the other thing is call them out. 
If someone's trying to treat you in a lower position as a child, call it out and say, look, it, it feels like you're, you're trying to dominate me emotionally. So actually, what I want to do is I want to reset that and have an adult to adult conversation. And let's yeah. talk about the data. And let's talk about the facts. And let's talk about the process. Yeah. And it tends to get people off that platform. Do you, do you think that people still do go into negotiations with this idea or mentality of trying to get as much as they can and screw the other party over? Absolutely. I thought the uh, the days of the table were long gone, but it's not. Uh, a lot of people I talk to, a lot of organizations that I work with, they meet very adversarial negotiators. Typically, when you're meeting, a, you're a seller, meeting a big company who's the buyer. Again, very typically that happens. There's also, I think, a myth. A lot of people, if you did a poll of a thousand people and said, what kind of negotiator are you? Are you win-win or are you adversarial? I want to claim as much value as I can. 95% will say they're win-win. It's blatantly not true. Yeah. Absolutely, categorically not true. It's a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. Because in most negotiations, someone is claiming a lot more value than the other. Hmm. And what happens is concessions happen. In a negotiation, what should happen is, let's say we're negotiating over something, and let's say I want to buy 100 pens off you, Johnny. You've got amazing pens. Uh, and I want to buy a, a, you know, a, a hundred pens off you. And we start negotiating and you set a price. And I say, okay, that's very interesting. It's $3 a pen. I'm not sure I can afford $3 a pen. What about three twenty? And we start bartering. That, that's, not, that's not negotiating a win-win outcome. That's just bartering over price. Hmm. But if I start saying, what's important to me is, yes, the price, but, but also the colors, Johnny. Do they come in all sorts of different colors? Could you give me 20 of each color? And you go, Maybe. And you go, well, also holding, I haven't got any storage room because these pens are, they come in big cases. Could you hold them for me? And then I could call off on them. And payment terms, a bit short on cash. I can pay you, but could I pay you in three tranches over three months? What you're doing now is if, if you're forcing me to a price that I don't really want to go to, but it's my minimum, I'll accept. I want something back from you. I want yeah. better payment terms. I want stock holding. I want something back from you that allows me to say that concession is a good trade. Too often in negotiations, you'll see people concede, concede, concede. After the third concession, something happens. I, as a negotiator, now know that you're weak. So I'll right. push my advantage. And the second thing that happens is the person on the other side emotionally starts to, you start to physically recoil because you're now on the back foot. You haven't asked for anything in exchange. You've accepted three of these. So now it looks like you'll accept anything. I wonder how far they'll go. So again, if you accept something as a concession, ask for something in return. Mm. It can be something small, but the act of asking will put you on a more even keel. Yeah. Now, as someone who's spent a lot of time with Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and, and I've studied that a lot and I've practiced it a lot, that's probably a point at which I'd be saying, if I follow his teaching, how am I supposed to do that? Right. Okay. So back to preparation. So what I would do is any negotiation has a lot more than price as a variable. If you write down any negotiation, you've probably got at least five variables that you can think about. So let's give some examples to your audience. If you're selling, for example, yes, you've got price, of course, but you've got payment terms, you've got contract length, you've got termination clauses, you've got termination period, uh, you've got renewal period, you've got IP, you've got access to brand marketing so that you can market it as a case study. There's six or seven already. What you do is you write those down. And then you do two simple things. For each variable, you say, what's my best outcome? And you write down for each one what my best outcome is. And then you go, what's my least acceptable outcome? And you write those down. So you've now got two extremes for each variable. And now have it in front of you and you can start to trade. You can start to say, well, if I give you that, then I want this. So yeah. if I give you something that's at my least acceptable range on one variable, I want something on my most acceptable range on the other variable. It's a bit like if you're a studio audio engineer and you're mixing a soundtrack. You've got all of these sliders in front of you and you're moving them up and down. You don't see an audio engineer push all of them to the top or all to the bottom. 
they're staggered. Yeah. And you're doing that live in the negotiation. On complex deals, a couple of things. One, always take a step back. So never negotiate in one session. Always have two or three sessions because it gives you time to think and reflect. And secondly, never agree to something in the room as a definite. That's good so you stuff. do this kind of multi-variable negotiation. So you put mm. all the variables on the table at, at one time. Let's say we've got you know, eight things we're negotiating around, Johnny. Often what I'll recommend is, look, let's take five of those and put them all on the table at, the, at, at once. We're going to hold three back for later because those are the things that might turn the deal in our favor. And we're going to hold those back as our kind of, in order to get the deal done, how about this? For those five, you put five variables on the table and you start negotiating around them. And if you say the price is now going to be $2.90, I go, okay, interesting. Let's park that for a second. Let's look at stockholding. What can you do on stockholding? Let's look at color variation. What can you do on color variation? So you don't agree to it, but you hold it. And if you say I can do nothing on stockholding and nothing on color, I say, I can't do $2.90. It now needs to be $3.30. Right. And so you're constantly having this to and fro where you're trying to work out what's important to each party that that they're prepared to trade on. There's another brilliant one, which I was taught, wow, 23, 24 years ago by a very seasoned, very seasoned salesperson, IBM trained back in the day. They trained, they really trained their salespeople. They're amazing. And Matthew said to me one day, he said, Mike, never be emotionally wedded to the outcome. I said, what do you mean, Matthew? What does that mean? And he said, look, when you walk into negotiation of any type, you've got to be emotionally detached, as we said before, and you can't want the outcome too much. The moment you want the outcome too much and you've spent the money in your head, if you're selling a company and someone offers you $3 million for your business and in your head you spent the $3 million already, you're doomed. You're absolutely doomed. Yeah. Because there'll be chipping going on. And once I know as a buyer that you've spent the money in your head, now I'm going to start chipping away. Yeah. I talk about similar principles in, in coaching with clients of right. not being too attached to their outcomes of, of their yeah. goals as well. And it relates to exactly the same way of if you're overly attached to it, you're not going to accept other things that might actually take you down a better or more interesting path. You, you lose a lot of your flexibility and, yeah, and, and your ability, I guess, your ability to negotiate with yourself to, to some degree as to where exactly. you want, where you end up and what you do. So you lock yourself into something that you may not actually be able to end up with in, in the long term. So not being too attached to it, like great to have a direction to go in and know what you want the outcome to, to look like, but to be able to, work your way around that because most of life is about negotiation and it figuring is. things out as we go along, right? An important point on that, Johnny, I think, is that that locking in a position, the danger is, take that example we had before, five negotiation variables, and you put them all on the table at once and you start negotiating and you start trading off. Let's say you don't do that. Let's say you do it in sequence. So I start with price and I work hard with you on price. And I think I've got a good deal. We're at $2.90 for these pens. And we lock that in. And then I say, now, colors. Oh, I forgot to ask you. Colors, right. Important. Can I have 20 of each of these five different colors? And you go, no, you can't. And I go, oh, it's a bit disappointing. And um, well, in that case, can we make it $3.20? You'd say, no, we agreed $2.90. I've locked that away. So I've locked that in the cupboard. It's $2.90. What's your next question? And you're like, well, that's yeah. outrageous. And it's like, no, 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 you agreed. We wrote down, look, I've got it on a paper, $2.90. That's why sequential negotiations are dangerous. Right. So do you then have to be a bit clearer? You say potentially yes, rather than definite yes. <laughs> you maybe need, yeah. to re- I say, need to clarify. Let's park that. it. So that's yeah. interesting. I understand where you're coming from. Let's park it for a second. Yeah. The second yeah. thing you can do, Uh, to find out what's going on behind the scenes is you say, okay, it's $2.90. Let's part that for a second. But just tell me what's behind that. Why is it $2.90? Why is that the price? And you're like, well, what do you mean? It's just the price. But if you looked at at why that's important to you, is the price more important than the payment terms? Is color variation more important than the price? Is the reorder number more important? What is it that's important to you, Johnny? 
You're always trying to find out people's interests. $2.90 is a demand. Right. Why you need it, what's important to you, is the interest that sits behind the demand. You're always trying to find out the interests. Adversarial negotiations tend to be based on demands. More sophisticated negotiations are based on the interest behind those demands. If I can get to understand your interests and you'll reveal them to me and I'll reveal mine, we tend to get a more balanced negotiated outcome. We tend to get more value for both parties because we've understood the underlying interest behind those demands and those positions that people are taking. And it's really hard to do. It's quite a sophisticated technique and requires confidence to start probing why. Because the first answer back is, I'm not telling you. So you have to keep going away. I want to come to the confidence thing in just a moment, but before we do, there is one question that was on my mind as to, okay, I mentioned Chris Voss earlier and and you laughed and I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to start any beef between you and Chris. But are, are there any are there any points of disagreement on negotiations that you have with perhaps his content? Yeah, I mean, Chris is a very very talented guy. Like, yeah, he was the ex lead FBI negotiator. So I've never done that job. Couldn't do that job. I suspect. Mm. Uh, very very talented. Clearly, he focuses a lot on the the emotional aspects of negotiation, and rightly so, about how you talk people down how you get hostages released. Why can you never split the difference? Because if you've got six hostages, we can't kill three and say we've won because three survived. We're trying to get all six out. That's the plan. And so I get where he comes from. I think where when Chris tries to apply all that learning from hostage negotiation into the business world, I think some of the challenges are around. Actually, sometimes we do split the difference. And the reason is because we'll split the difference on price because we've got other things that are more important to us. Whereas in a hostage negotiation, I suspect the primary thing is we need to get the hostages out. And so that's quite different because you've got a singular variable that you're trying to um, achieve the goal for. Mm. Whereas in a business to business negotiation, as discussed, I might have six, nine, 12 variables. And some of those nine, you know, three of them are very important to me, but three different ones might be important to you. So I'm prepared to split the difference on payment terms. You say 90 days, I say 30, we agree at 45. That is splitting the difference technically. It's a perfectly valid thing to do Yeah. because what's important to me is contract length. I want a 12-month contract. So I'm prepared to do that in exchange for a 12-month contract. And that's where I think me and Chris would disagree. He's a talented yeah. guy, there's no doubt. Even if he does agree with you, he can't admit it now because he's, he's never split the difference. Never split the difference. <laughs> Interesting about pinning yourself to a name, never split the difference. As you say, it's a brand positioning piece. So, yeah, I've got a lot of value out of that book and I've got a lot of benefit from right. implementing a lot in there. So it's been very helpful and it's not nothing against Chris, but it's just curiosity from yeah. my part as to where you might have some differences. And, and it really makes sense what you're saying. The business world is not the same as the world of hostage negotiations. No. They're not identical. And so, yeah, some concessions and some splitting the difference is called for at times. And I, I can it certainly is. see that from my own experience as well. Otherwise, so, we'd end up in this position whereby if we're trying to negotiate and I just take an extreme position on all nine yeah. variables, and you do the same, there's no deal. Yeah. So you just walk away. Yeah. And, and at that point, you can't really call your SWAT team to come in and not really. sort it all out for you. <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> not really. So I said I wanted to come to the confidence bit. And yes. I teach I, in public speaking skills and presentation skills trainings that I teach. One of the things to talk about with having the confidence is, I say a lot of it comes from the practice practicing what you do, knowing what you're doing before you get on there and feeling confident that you can deliver it because it's the winging it often for people that they don't feel confident about. People don't feel confident in their ability to improvise. People don't feel confident or competent if they're not prepared for stuff. Is it the same with negotiations? And are there any other things that you do encourage people to think about in terms of improving their confidence? That's, it's a great question. And I'd be, after I've given my views, it'd be great to hear your tips on actually how to improve confidence because I suspect a lot of those will be applicable in any negotiation. It's interesting. So just take this session. So we're doing a recording. You kindly asked me to come on as a guest and talk about negotiation. Uh, and I said in advance, is, is there much preparation I need to do in advance of this beyond I sent you some materials that yeah. were quite detailed about what I do? And you said, no, 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 we'll have a discussion. My preparation has been happening for 25 years. 
around negotiation. So in this kind of format, I've got enough knowledge, experience, stories to draw on that we can make it into an interesting, lively dialogue, hopefully, for your audience. And that preparation has been going on for years and years and years. If I was walking into a negotiation for a client, which I do often, I do deal negotiation coaching. So they lead and I sit as the negotiation coach in the background. I'll do a lot of preparation for them. Yeah. So I'll prepare that negotiation in quite a lot of detail and think about the different aspects to that negotiation and use my own templates. And that gives me confidence in the negotiation when my client's negotiating a deal. One client recently selling their business. They were the lead negotiator. They had many principle to principle discussions. Before those discussions, I talked to him about, I've done some th- thinking, I've done some research. Here's my views on where we are in the process. Remember that process thing I said? Yeah. There are many stages to the negotiation process. Here's where I think we are. Here's what I think is on the table. Here's what I suggest you bring to the table as variables that you want to discuss. And that gave that person a huge amount of confidence in those 30-minute, 20-minute negotiation sessions. So it has a the preparation has a substantial impact on confidence. Yeah. Yeah, I think that you know, in terms of public speaking and presentation skills, there are different ways to prepare for that. And I think ultimately it's practice. But I know that a lot of people will try to memorize stuff and you certainly can't really do that in a negotiation. There may be some facts or figures that yeah. you do need to have pretty much solid, but you, you're also going to have your notes there. and You're not going to need to memorize too much, probably. I'll tell um, you the best way, by the way. Yeah. So just uh, as because you've now triggered a, a thought in my mind, as happens with all these discussions, the best thing you can do is there's two bits for an important negotiation. One, prepare really well, process templates, et cetera, goals. Then have a dry run. Sit down with someone, you, me, one of their colleagues, an experienced negotiator, and dry run the negotiation with them. And ask the counterparty that you're dry running with to ask the most difficult questions in the most difficult way that they can think of. Yeah. And do it live. Do it for real. So don't pretend. Do it for real. The learning from that is colossal because it takes your thinking, it turns it into practice when you're negotiating, and you get these really unexpected responses back. I did one literally on Monday for a client, and we were talking to four suppliers about a particular category of spend that they had. And I intervened three or four times on the call with the suppliers. Yeah around a very particular area. And at the end of the call, the guy said to me, wow, you, <laughs> you were really, really tough with them. So yeah, I was tough. I was fair, but tough. And it put the supplier on the back foot. And that's because we prepared really well. And I'm very experienced at what I do, but definitely do a dry run. Yeah. Yeah. The- there's a lot of value in rehearsal and I'm talking about practice and that's ultimately what I'm talking about is rehearsal. Yes. And there are many types of rehearsal. And I would say in addition to that, to feel more confident, I would go with mental rehearsal. I would go with state rehearsal. How do you actually want to be feeling? Know in advance, how are you going to respond if you get asked that difficult question? So you yeah. don't look like a, a stunned mullet or something, you know. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, because you don't want to give away that you're like, you, oh, I wasn't ready for that. Or, uh, yeah. oh, my goodness, what am I going to say now? But also to help keep yourself calm. So, yeah, I love what you're saying about actually do a, do a dry run and treat it as the real thing and get yeah. as many difficult questions as you can. And, and even then, it may not fully prepare you for <laughs> exactly what's going to no. come, but, but you are going to look and seem more competent and confident where you're out there. And Interestingly, you know, I do a lot of the sort of influence and persuasion study and the perception of confidence in so many ways is much more important often than factual realities. Absolutely. So pe- people's actually emotional desire to put trust in people who are confident is much stronger. Whereas, you know, this, I don't know if you're familiar with this, a quote from Bertram Russell, a philosopher, about uh, a great irony of life being that intelligent people are so unsure and less intelligent people are so full of confidence. And uh, it's, I'm very much paraphrasing that. But it, it's, yeah, yeah. it's often very much the case that people go and put their trust in confidence because someone who may be, I don't know, may seem a bit dithery, may seem a bit like there's 
going through the choices or having a think about it. Whereas someone who just says, we do this or go forward, that seems much more attractive and appealing. But ultimately, that is purely on an emotional level. It's certainly not on a logical Correct. level at all. So, But that's how powerful it can be in any situation. I can appreciate in negotiation, coming across as confident is, is absolutely critical because as soon as you don't, there's a doorway <laughs> to, to get you to a position you don't want to be in. I mean, there's a very interesting analogy there, I think, around panel based presentations. So if you're in a sales process and you it's an RFP, so the request for proposals come in, you've decided to respond. There's many reasons why you wouldn't, by the way. So there's many reasons why you qualify RFPs out. But let's say you've, you've responded, you've written your tender response, and let's say you've been shortlisted and you now get to the presentation. So this is your home territory, Johnny, whereby, you know, it's now a pitch and you'll have been asked for a panel. Let's assume it's a physical face-to-face -face, and, and you walk in and you've prepared your pitch and you've prepared your story and your key insights and you've thought about a few questions. If you haven't thought about the different audience stakeholders in that room, then this is what I suspect will happen. So let's say it's worth half a million dollars a year. So it's a biggish deal. And let's say you've got, it's a marketing pitch. So you've got the CMO sat in the room You've got finance sat in the room and you've got procurement sat in the room. If you bring the A team to your pitch, which you would, it's a half million dollar deal, but the A team isn't going to be the one that's delivering. There's another team sat in the wings that aren't there that actually would be doing the work. This is what will happen from a confidence point of view. As you're presenting, <clears throat> it gets to me and I sit there and I say, it's very interesting. Let, let me just ask a couple of questions about your team. Yeah, yeah. You seem very confident. You've obviously done this before. Are you the ones that will be seen day to day? Person goes, well, no, no, we've got a big team. We balance resources. And I'll say, yeah, that's, I get all that. Specifically, Johnny, are you the lead on this project? And I'll be seeing you every week for 12 months. Is that the case? And in that moment, that crystal glass of confidence could be shattered in mm. one hammer blow. And if you crumble at that point, because where do you go now? It's not you. It's going to be someone else. You can't lie in front of the potential client. And that confidence can easily be shattered <clears throat> if you've not thought through this in detail. And what we used to do, I was at KPMG. So we did lots of work on this about pitching in front of panels. Uh, you'd always have the delivery lead in the room. So if I was your delivery lead, you'd say, no, no, it's not me, but it's Mike. Mike, just talk the client through how it works, how you're going to be involved, what your oversight will be, what the review meetings will be, and that problem goes away. So thinking about the different people in that room when you're pitching and what their different types of questions will be is really important to maintaining confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Pitching is such a critical element. And I guess people don't always think about it as being part of the negotiation, but sometimes it's where it is. negotiation begins. And so you know, clearly preparation for that is, is super important. But we also see even sometimes when people are prepared, they still go to pieces in their pitches. And I, you do. I, I guess you maybe watch Dragon's Den and things like that. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we see it on, on that. And okay, it's maybe not saying exactly the same as real world situations, but I think it gives a, some pretty good ideas yeah. and examples of that and, and you certainly know when somebody does their pitch well as a difference to when somebody really doesn't or you can see sometimes that the, one of the dragons will pick on to something and exactly. then then the person pitching or the people pitching fall apart and everything starts to crumble the nerves start to show the confidence disappears and, and all of that so all of the stuff we're talking about here is just as relevant to making a pitch as it is to actually being in uh it is more of a formal negotiation situation. And in fact, there's this technique again, you know, practical tip for your audience uh, called the five whys. A uh, very well-researched piece of very simple, very simple technique is that as a negotiator, uh, and particularly on a panel, what happens is you'll say something uh, like, I don't know, so we've done this kind of work hundreds of times before for clients in your sector. I go, okay, that's, that's kind of interesting. Just give me some examples. And you'll say, okay, fine. So you give me two examples. And I'll say, okay, why did that client behave in that way? And, and how did you get the outcome you got? And you'll explain. And I'll say, okay, so just talk to me about this bit. Why did that happen? And you're like, okay, well, I can talk about that. So your confidence level's now dropped 30%. 
And then I go deeper. I say, well, just talk about that bit that you just talked about there, that that piece of data that that you didn't really reveal. Why was that a problem? What really happened? So this five whys is you keep probing. And most people, if you get past the third why, you've done really well. Because five whys of depth about the kind of root cause of a a particular problem tends to, if you get to like the third or fourth why, as a negotiator, as a buyer, I'm like, okay, you seem pretty confident. You know what you're doing. You've done this before. You've got the evidence base. You understand the root causes. uh, And you've gone to quite a decent depth. Okay, I'll stop at that. I'll stop on that track. I'll try something else now instead. And that's a good way of preparing is thinking about what the next question would be. You very kindly sent me some a lot of great information, actually. I, I was able to spend some time preparing for, for our chat today. I, I already right. pretty much knew the kinds of things I wanted to be asking you. But in some of the information you sent through, you talk a bit about, I'm going to have to just double check exactly, distributive and integrative negotiation and the difference. Yeah. Can you explain a bit of that for us and why it's important to understand the difference between them, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, sure. Most negotiations are distributive which is, it's kind of like, I win something, you win something. It, it's a, uh, you're distributing value. So you've got a fixed piece of pie. You're basically cutting the pie up. An integrative negotiation is where you get into the, and that, that first one is around demands, right? You want two pe- $2.90. I'll accept $2.90. I want 90-day payment terms. You say, we're not in 90 days. We're going to have 40 days. I say, I can't do 40 days. Can we do 25? We agree at 37. Yeah, that's a distributive negotiation because you're distributing the kind of the value between two parties. And it's adversarial. It's based on demands. They tend to be quite short. Example, if you're buying a car, you're buying a house, tends to be very distributive as a negotiation. Yeah. An integrative negotiation has a few different characteristics. First of all, the deals tend to be more strategic. They're more important to both parties. Secondly, the way the negotiation is set up, which is a key part, is that set up. In advance of discussions, quite a lot of information is exchanged and interests start to appear about what we're really interested in, what's really important to us. During the negotiation, we're probing the interests far more and trying to make the pie bigger. We're trying to work out how do we create more value for both parties during that negotiation. That's the key is an integrative negotiation is expanding the pie. And you expand the pie because you talk about interests. Yeah. A yeah, particular example, I did a deal many, many years ago now, which springs to mind, uh, which was around we were buying IT services. And I was renegotiating a contract around one particular IT service. And with a colleague of mine, actually, the two of us were, were working on it. And we were negotiating around a very particularly narrow IT service. As we started to talk to this supplier, it became very apparent that they did a lot more than what we thought. They started to ask us questions about what we really needed from a kind of a user perspective and our audience perspective. And we ended up with a deal that would have been pick any value. Let's say it was 30K turned into a 100K deal because they'd worked out, well, we could actually consolidate three or four of your suppliers into one service that we can provide. And we'd worked out they had a lot more capability and experience and depth of capability than we thought. Yeah. And that was an integrative negotiation where although we'd gone from, call it 30 to 100, I don't know what the numbers were now, I've forgotten. But that 30 to 100, someone would say, you've broken your budget by a factor of three. I'm like, no, I haven't because I've looked at all of my spend and I've actually got a much better deal at a lower price than I could by having these four providers. And that, I think, as a supplier, if you're negotiating with a buyer, that's a really interesting territory to get into if you can. Yeah, It relies upon asking probing questions about what's behind their demands and getting into their business issues and what's driving their business and their business objectives. Is it always good going into negotiations to lay your cards on the table and be clear about what your position actually is? Or if if there are some clear weaknesses, uh, maybe you do have some potential financial issues coming up should you actually keep that to yourself (laughs) this this is a great topic because it talks to something called anchoring anchoring in negotiations is really important and anchoring is whereby one party let's pick on price because it's easy 
one party sets the price. It's called a price anchor. The research says, and there was lots of work done on this, as you can imagine, the person that sets the anchor tends to get the best value out of the deal because people drift around price anchors by about 10 or 20% typically. In a scenario whereby, let's say as a buyer, I'm a very sophisticated buyer. I know my market really, really well. Let's say I'm buying some marketing services and I know marketing services really, really well. I know the market pricing really well, the commercial models really well. When I walk into negotiation with a supplier, I'll set the anchor really early on, like at the beginning of the session. Hmm. I've read your proposal. It's very interesting. Yeah, it's kind of the kind of thing that we're uh, interested in. It's broadly the right kind of scope. Let me just tell you something, though. Your price is way, way off. The market price for these services, based upon all the evidence that I've got in my experience, is not half a million dollars a year. It's, you know, 350,000 uh, pounds a year. And the supplier sits there and goes, that's impossible. And you're like, well, that's the market price. If you're yeah. not interested, that's okay. We'll cut the meeting short now and I'll go and find someone else. You're like, no, 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 wait, 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 hang on. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about this. Yeah. So price anchoring is absolutely critical in the negotiation and it relies upon excellent market knowledge. So if you've got really good market knowledge and you know where your price is compared to the market, you can anchor high first in what they call the zone of agreement. And this is a really valuable tip. And I know I'm going to be going back and listening to the replay of this and, and making a lot of notes. I need to come to you for a masterclass, Mike, really. I wish, we had, I wish we had time for it today, to be honest. Uh, but we do need to start wrapping things up. I know you have, uh, you sure. have to go for, for another meeting shortly. But yeah. Before we do, where could people find out more about you and more about negotiation skills? So if they go to piscari.com, P-I-S-C-A-R-I.com, onto our website, there's plenty of stuff there. And the other thing is find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I do a lot of posting. So just Mike Lander on LinkedIn. Uh, connect with me. Ask me questions. I'm always open to discussions about negotiation. It's a fascinating topic. It, it definitely is. Now, before we do close up, there, there are a few questions I always like to ask people. Uh, one of them is for book recommendation, and it could be related to negotiation skills. I guess you're probably not going to say never split the difference, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but what would be uh, your book recommendation? And you can have two if you really want to. Okay. So one is Getting to Yes. William Yori's book, Getting to Yes. Easy read. Read it in two hours. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. Yeah. Um, the second one would be, I've actually got a book coming out in the near future. Rather than recommending my own book, I'd recommend the work by Cialdini on influence, which you've probably already read, I suspect. Yeah, I am currently working through the new and expanded version, ah. which uh, which is fantastic. Yeah. And, um, is it an improvement on the original? Because the original was amazing. I wasn't sure it would be. I thought, I've, I know, I've read the, some of the other books that Cialdini's done with other people. And I thought it was going to be more of a conglomeration. But no, mm. there, there's some new stuff in there. It's a different style of approach to delivering it. Uh, and I am getting so much value from visiting that. And there is some stuff that wasn't in the original book as well. So it is totally worth checking out. Brilliant piece of work. And it plays yeah. a lot into negotiation. Yeah, yeah. You know, about yeah. reciprocity, scarcity, all of those principles apply. Yeah, Robert Cialdini's at the top of my dream guest list. So maybe one day. So to wrap things up for today, what if there's one thing you would like people to take away from this, or one thing to remember from what we talked about today, what would it be? I'll take a chance and say two things. Okay. Self-confidence, preparation, and they're linked. That will yeah. get you much better outcomes in any negotiation. <laughs> and it's good advice for life, not just for negotiations. It is. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming and joining me as a guest. I've really enjoyed the conversation. There's so many more questions I had for you, but <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have time for. So maybe we can bring you back again in the future. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for being a guest on Speaking Influence. That's a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. Me too.
Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure that you subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, please share the show out with your friends and network. Look, if you know anyone who would be interested in being better at business negotiation, and let's face it, who wouldn't, then this is a particularly good episode to share out. And who knows, maybe I will still manage to get Chris Voss to come on the show at some point in the future. I'm going to keep trying and we'll have a bit more of a discussion but we'll definitely bring Mike Lander back and if you have learned one thing that you can put into action today please make sure that you do that and I think there's definitely more than one thing if you enjoyed the show make sure that you tune in again next time I have a really wonderful array of guests coming up who are experts in influence and persuasion which is the prime focus of this show now and I may mean to make this the number one podcast about influence and persuasion and I need your help to do that so if you could support the show in any way either sharing that out subscribing or maybe even buying me a coffee on the supercast link in the show notes please do that and of course do check the show notes if you want to get in touch with Mike and if you want to join us live for any of the recordings and ask the guests your questions then please make sure you're following me on LinkedIn and other social media I'll look forward to seeing you again next time have an amazing week go and make great things happen